Hello, Maverick Traders. Welcome out to How to Trade Futures. We're going to talk about the InteractiveBrokers.com trader workstation platform that is a professional trading platform that allows you to trade a variety of different markets. And today our focus is on the futures market. So let's jump right in. So if we go to the Interactive Brokers website, you can see that they trade almost any market available. They're, I mean, as robust a platform as you can find. If we go into futures, they talk about you know commissions and different commodities that you can trade. When you think about the futures markets, it's big on commodities. There are financial futures. You can trade uh, the S&P 500, the Dow futures, the NASDAQ futures. You can trade interest rates, so some financial products. But a lot of it is at the CBOT, the Chicago Board of, of Trade, which is where commodities trade so you could trade pork bellies and this and that right so if we come over to kind of look at different contracts and different ideas and whatnot it shows you that you can trade futures on currencies this is something our FX division uh, may have more interest in and you can see that there are trades on Bitcoin futures so if you are interested in shorting the Bitcoin market really the best most effective way to probably bet against the crypto market Bitcoin or Ethereum or those would be in the future space and so there's some symbols for that you could also trade obviously a variety of different markets like we talked about on the CBOT or the CBOE there's different futures on the ice um, we'll show you this as we pull up the platform that there are a variety of different exchanges that trade these and if you wanted to trade the contracts that are on, let's say, the New York Mercantile Exchange, you'd actually have to uh, set up the data to get the, the New York Mercantile Exchange data. And so there's different platforms, again, for you to be able to use that. But if we put in some different symbols, let's say we were searching for Bitcoin. I can just come in and type in Bitcoin and it'll give me some ideas of okay here are some different assets and different things and you'll notice under the products that it'll say stock or cryptocurrency or fund and then we start to get to the futures and this one happens to trade on the CME the Chicago Mercantile Exchange here you can see another micro Bitcoin so if you want to trade the full size or the micro there's different ones available to you let's go ahead and pull up the futures and let's say we wanted to trade Bitcoin and let's go with one of these that's closer to a front month here you can see the futures contracts Bitcoin trading at 22,900 we could buy the contract or we could sell the contract either way and that's what you do with futures you're directional you're betting that the price is going to go up or down and taking your position accordingly if we were to buy this futures contract we of course are buying it at this price and then it has the multiplier effect right now of course we might split the bid ask spread we could say okay well we might be able to buy it at 22,900 and kind of split the bid ask spread but wherever you get filled on the order that's your entry price it's like buying a stock you make or lose money based on the difference between your entry and your exit so if we buy at 22,900 we would need Bitcoin to trade up to make money. Of course, if it trades down, we would lose money. You'll notice that there is the micro, as it showed, and this is usually the case. We have a separate video for micro futures, but micro are basically one-tenth the size. So here we're looking at the full contract size, BRR. Here we're looking at a micro contract. You'll notice essentially the same price we could again buy at 22,900 but if we were trading the micro we would have one-tenth the risk and reward one-tenth of the multiplier so instead of having the full-size contract bigger dollar risk and reward we could trade one-tenth the size if we desire to do that most of the time when you think about futures you're thinking about commodities you're thinking about uh, maybe the S&P products and the most popular is the ES 
the ES is the S&P 500 E-mini future, not the micro, the full-size contract. If we pull up the futures on the ES, you'll notice that all of these different contract months will trade at different prices. Okay, let's pull up a few of them. So if we pull up the E-minis for March and June and September, you can see that the spot price is different than, than the future price and so forth. Um, if we were to look at the S&P 500 right now, the S&P 500, just to put things into perspective, the spot price is going to be around 4000 or so. So you'll notice that at 4000 the March contract is closest to spot SPX, the spot price. The futures prices can be quite a bit different. And here you're seeing the price is well above the spot price. Again, the index itself is around 4000 the futures around 4065-ish. Now, why that discrepancy? Why that difference? Well, uh, basically, there's a lot of different factors that go into play, but over time, the spot price and the future contract, that gap will continue to narrow. So theoretically, you could take a trade where you short this futures contract because it's elevated and try to buy other things and kind of narrow that gap. There may be a little bit of an arbitrage situation there. But for most traders, it's simply not something that they can fully take advantage of because if they shorted this contract, they would have risk and reward from this moment on to the market going up uh, would be risk or down would be reward. Now they might feel like they have a little bit of a margin of safety because it's elevated to spot, but that does not guarantee success. The same thing can happen in any futures contract and they can trade at a variety of different prices. So let's bring up light sweet crude and we'll pull up the full size contract. So CL is the symbol for light sweet crude. I'm going to pull up the futures across multiple time periods and then you're going to see the difference in price. Now this is not a vast difference, right? About 30 cents difference there, about 20 cents difference there. This is something that happens in the futures markets. It's referred to as contango or backwardation. When you have, we expect prices to get more expensive in the future. So if the, the further out traded a higher price, that's normal pricing, and that's called contango. So you see the, the difference. It gets more expensive and more expensive. That's contango. Sometimes the prices can flip, and this is the tricky part about the futures markets, is each of these contracts can really trade independent of the other. So we might think, well, if oil goes up, all of these have to go up, and that's not true. If oil goes down, all of these have to go down, and that's not true. They can trade differently based on how the market sees the supply and demand over different periods of time. Let me give you an example. Let's say that something disrupts the oil market, and for some reason, there is not going to be as much supply of oil, you know, millions of barrels are destroyed, there's not going to be as much oil available in March as the market had previously anticipated. So what's going to happen to each of these contracts? Well, the March is going to skyrocket because they say, hey, we're not going to have enough supply for demand. And so the short-term deliverables skyrocket because now people are battling over the oil. They say, hey, I'm an airline. I need to have oil here. I need to lock in the price. And so the short-term contracts become more expensive. But maybe May doesn't move at all. So can March skyrocket and May stay stagnant? Yeah, that absolutely can and does happen in the futures markets. Why? Because they say, well, by May, they'll be able to produce more oil, right? They'll, uh, they'll open up the spigots, they'll, you know, drive more, they'll pull more out of the ground, they'll do what they need to do to make up the gap. By May, we'll have this issue solved. By March, we may not be able to. 
so the short-term deliverables skyrocket and the longer-term don't. That could create what they call backwardation. Backwardation is where the shorter term trade expensive compared to the longer term. You're backwards to normal, you're backwardated. And so if this were skyrocketed and went to 85 and this stayed at 80, you'd have $5 of backwardation. Backwardation usually indicates that something is disrupted, abnormal, you know, something out of the ordinary. And again, this is kind of the danger of these contracts and these futures is, look, things can trade wildly and independent of the other. Uh, the oil market is not quite as aggressive as like nat gas. Natural gas is often referred to as the widow maker because, again, all of these things can happen where um, shorter terms, skyrockets, longer term plummets, all sorts of varieties and changes and things of that sort. So you do have to be careful to not think of the futures markets like you do maybe an option. See, an option is a derivative. If the stock moves, all of the options move accordingly. With, with futures, the underlying commodity can change in value, the spot price, but different futures will trade in different ways based on the supply and demand of those contracts. So normally there's some, you know, normal kind of trading that happens where they move together, but that's not always the case. So you do have to be careful about that. So this is an example of a variety of different large size contracts. If we come back to the E-mini, the S&P 500, if you were to trade this, again, buy and sell, you'll notice the pricing. These do not trade in penny increments. In this case, they trade in 0.25 increments. So 30, this is as tight a bid ask spread as you can get. 39.92 to 39.92, uh, well, it's moving, but 50 to 75, that's as close as it can get. When this one shifts, you'll see that one shift, and they'll usually stay about as liquid as possible. If you come out to a later dated expiration, then you'll get more uh, distance between bid and ask, and that's not a good thing. Buyers and sellers are further apart. Here you can see there's a dollar fifty to a dollar twenty-five difference between buyers and sellers, and it gets more exaggerated the further out you go. Here's four to five dollars of bid ask spread. The same thing is typically true of a variety of different contracts. You'll have more liquidity usually in the shorter dated, the front month type of contracts, and then less liquidity as you move back further. For the ES, one of the most popular assets to trade, it's $50 of value per point. So if we had bought at $39.91.75 when we first clicked this button, you can see that it's now up to $3993, let's call it $3992.75, okay, right there. That's one point. We're up one point having bought this. So that would be $50 of value. If this were to trade down, and let's say it went to $39.90.75, we would be one point under what we paid. We'd be down $50. So $50 per point, and everything you trade has a different multiplier. So you need to become familiar with what the risk and the reward is of any contract. Like CL, every one of these pennies is worth $10. So it's a big contract. Uh, a full $1 move is worth a thousand bucks. It's a, a an aggressive contract. Now much of what these markets trade is technical based is kind of saying okay I'm gonna I'm gonna chart the S&P 500 figure out where I think it's gonna go and then I might use the futures markets to express that viewpoint. So I say, okay, uh, what's my thesis? What's my outlook on the S&P? Well, we've been, you know, coming up to this trend line and so forth, and we're currently pulling back a little bit. Where do I think this is going to go? How's it going to behave? And you'd find different points and different entry and exit points. You'd, you'd obviously uh, want to have stop losses in place. You never trade these with unlimited risk. So if I were going to buy here, I can right click and attach 
either a stop by itself or maybe I attach a bracket order. Now what does a bracket order do? Whenever I attach a bracket, I go to GTC, good till canceled, but basically a bracket says, I'm gonna put my, my target price out here and I'm gonna put my stop loss out here and we're gonna have a certain amount of risk and reward. Let's make it more easy to follow. So in this case, I'm trying to buy at 39.91, target 40.11, so I'm trying to make 20 points, and my stop loss is at 39.84, it's seven points below. I'm risking seven to make 20 or whatever, this is a hypothetical of course, but I have my, my sell target and my sell stop loss attached to my buy order, and I would like to trade in this way in most situations in the futures markets. I certainly always have a stop loss, but a lot of times I'll also have a target. Remember, these are directional, they're tradable, and you're, you're targeting certain moves over certain periods of time. So if I were placing this trade, I would probably have for sure the stop attached, and you can just right click to attach a stop, and maybe even the full bracket where I also put the target out there. Now, if I were to transmit the primary order, if the primary order executes, if it goes through, then the target and the stop loss are also in place. They are also um, immediately sent to the market once the primary order executes, once it hits our price. If the primary order does not hit our price, it will cancel away at the end of the day, and so will the child orders. One thing to be aware of is margin requirements. So if we look at the margin requirements for trading any of these contracts, we can go to, again to the IB website and here's kind of a breakdown. If you trade the E-minis, it gives you your initial margin requirement. It's going to be around $8,000. That's to trade it intraday. So if you were just going to trade it and buy and sell during the market hours, you're going to be about 8,000. If you trade it into after hours, your margin requirement goes up. And you can see it goes up pretty substantially towards about 12,000 or so dollars for one contract. So you have to plan on about 8,000 in margin requirement intraday up to about 12,000 if you hold into the overnight session. And your margin requirements can change like that. Each contract, whatever you're trading, it'll have different margin requirements based on, you know, the risk and reward, and they'll change those requirements, difference between intraday versus overnight margins and so forth. There's a variety of different contracts you can trade. You can see, I mean, the amount of symbols and things. Here's treasury futures that you could trade, what your initial intraday margin is, what your overnight margin is etc. So sometimes there are there can be currency swaps. So if you're trading currency futures, there can be a little bit of an overnight fee for trading the, those into the after hours and such. So as you trade futures, you just need to get more familiar with them, of course. They are directional and in many ways we can create the same type of risk reward probability with the options market instead, but that's a little bit more information about trading futures on the Trader Workstation platform. So thanks everyone for joining us. On behalf of Maverick Trading, I'm Corey Halliday. We'll see you next time. Goodbye everyone.